hair down time. This is the uh, Raspberry Pi Zero 2W. Uh, it's claim to fame. It looks like it has uh, an exciting new chip in the middle here. Uh, in fact, it actually even has the Raspberry Pi logo, so it suggests it could be some sort of very custom packaging going on. Let's uh, take a look at that chip. We'll just uh, desolder from the circuit board and then uh, uh, basically uh, drop in some acid so we can dissolve it and find what's inside of it. Um, and we do that actually. It's interesting. It's much more than just simply a single piece of silicon. It's a rather sophisticated packaging system where it has multiple chips. Uh, there's the main uh, system on chip, or SOIC, is basically the controller that uh, the Raspberry Pi uses. There's an associated DRAM with it, so basically the controller and the DRAM are put together. Uh, and then there looks like a third piece of silicon. In fact, it is a piece of silicon, but there's actually nothing on it. Uh, it's just known as a spacer. What happens, they create a little tower of chips. Uh, they have to do that because they need to get um, the connections have to go into a chip and basically they need to make sure when they stick the next chip on it, it doesn't uh, prevent the connection from happening so and this one I think the DRAM is at the bottom and they, then they poke the, the, the spacer and then that allows all of these connections and the edges here to be made and then they drop the silicon top. Uh, to do that you actually use gold so you actually if you de-encapsulate one of these chips uh, you end up with a little tiny pile of gold actually on your slide as well. Let's uh, first take a look at the SOIC. Uh, this is what's known as the top metal layer. So um, this uh, very silver or goldish area is the uh, power and ground distribution for the chip. Uh, under here is actually all the very interesting logic for the um, controller. Uh, on the edges here, uh, basically this is what's known as the I.O. ring. So on the left hand side here we see some sort of more sophisticated I.O. Uh, on these parts of the chip we see less sophisticated I.O. Uh, the sophistication is basically a function of how much area uh, it occupies. If you look really closely, uh, you can probably see that there's actually some breaks in this pattern. And it looks like there's some like lines, horizontal and vertical. If I just highlight those so they're a little easier to see, uh, what we have here basically is uh, another hint. We're looking at a system on chip, which is a combination of many bits of intellectual property put together because there's... The metalization patterns changed because the place route rules probably were demanding such of these actually have either power gating or special considerations. So, um, and that's uh, what we're going to take a look at next. Basically, take this metal off and uh, we'll see what we can see below it. Okay, actually, one further thing I need to do before we uh, actually look at the layers below the metal uh, is to take a look at what kind of chip it is. And uh, you can see the picture I've been set here. Uh, it's very common in silicon. The manufacturer will put a bit of hint actually telling you who made it, uh, in this case Broadcom, a very well-known large American corporation, um, and uh, their part number, the, the BCM2710. So uh, we now know it's Broadcom. Not a huge surprise if you actually ever used a Raspberry Pi, the traditional one, and not the Nano. Uh, they're all um, Broadcom silicon. Uh, in fact, the silicon was actually meant originally for uh, set-top boxes, um, so for cable TV. Um, this is basically now what's known as a polysilicon, so we can now see much more of the details emerging below. And you can sort of see things seem to be clumped uh, into uh, groups. Uh, and that's not a mistake, actually. Like each of these, even the little tiny one down here, so these are all basically uh, hierarchical parts of logic that were purchased either by the vendor or designed by them. And what they do is they, they get dropped down on the chip uh, and then wired together. Let's uh, start down the most important thing, I think, for everyone uh, who uses the Raspberry Pi, and that's the processors. Uh, Cortex uh, A53 is quite a decent processor, actually. Um, there's four of them on the chip, and in fact, if you ever do reverse engineer silicon, uh, the first thing you do, you know, if someone tells you it's four, <laughs> you look for four. Uh, and of course, you can see very much of a repeating pattern here. So each of these here is an A53 core. The, uh, the gray area, basically, is digital logic gates have been laid out automatically. And then these darker areas are SRAMs, uh, and occasionally a ROM. You might find one or two ROMs, but on average, most of these are SRAMs. Um, sometimes they look different in color, and that's because they're different. Sometimes they're single uh, or dual-ported, depending on the, the application required. So so uh, obviously, one, two, three, four, I've marked the cores, and then... Uh, Oh, one, two, two, three. I haven't marked them very well. Uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, there are definitely four cores there, though. And then in the center here, uh, there's a coordination function, I believe. Uh, basically, as all these cores operate, they have to have a way of uh, accessing uh, common resources. You basically need, uh, you, you need a, um, uh, 
uh, something to arbitrate between them. Also, you need to have a cache, basically, uh, and I believe this is actually one of the same. So, basically, these processors can coordinate their actions because uh, when you start coding a embedded firmware from multiple cores, you need some way of coordination. Of course, looking at this, you always think the Raspberry Pi is for our text, uh, four Cortex uh, ARM cores, and then you know some peripherals. And of course, uh, it seems like there's actually a huge part of the chip actually isn't. A processor, um, and actually that speaks to the the original provenance of this chip and uh, the cleverness of it. Uh, it was actually meant for set-top boxes for displaying a cable television, and uh, the biggest part of the chip, I believe, is what's known as the Video Core Four, uh, which is a bit of intellectual property Broadcom uses extensively uh, on all sorts of products. Um, and the way you can tell it actually is you you start looking around your I/O ring for good hints. Um, and we see a cluster of IOs. This is about enough IO for an LCD panel. This is about enough IO for an HDMI port, a composite video port, and then audio. You know, give me strong indication that the IO is always near the block, so that makes sure this is probably the core four block here. Uh, here you can see a lot of little lighter uh, blue. Again, that's SRAM, it's more digital logic. That's actually a lot of SRAM. Um, and uh, it's quite likely this is probably the buffer function because when you read the actual uh, data sheet in the core four, as you can see, well, actually there is no data sheet. <laughs> Broadcom's a super secretive company, but um, they, there are some details you can see here about what the core four has for capabilities and a video buffer is certainly one of them. So uh, that leaves this block here. I believe it's associated with the core four. Um, it's actually very hard to tell. Broadcom doesn't disclose their details very much. Um, there could be all sorts of latent features on this chip actually that, uh, haven't been described to the public, but um, on average, I believe the core four here, right in the middle, uh, occupying the greatest amount of silicon. Um, if you've ever unsuccessfully booted uh, a Raspberry Pi, you get four little colorful rectangles. Uh, that's basically a video core four booting up. Uh, it boots up well before the actual ARM cores. So uh, you know, when you're writing code for the ARM and this is the Linux environment, you think these are the master, but actually in this chip, it's quite unusual. Uh, the video core actually uh, controls this, uh, this part of the uh, device. In, in the boot cycle. What else can we see? Uh, now, of course, there's a lot of I.O. I think it's about 40 I.O. with the Raspberry Pi. Um, I.O. pins actually don't tend to require a lot of um, a lot of uh, I.O. cell size. So, And these looks about like about 40's worth here, so I suspect this is the GPIO on the left on the chip. Up here, a DRAM controller. Uh, DRAM is a very specialized I.O. cell. It requires a fair bit of speed, so I believe that the DRAM sits there. Uh, that would leave yeah, here. There has to, there's a USB uh, that looks probably like a USB function here. Uh, it's differential in nature. If you're to uh, zoom into silo cell, you would see a differential, um, and that would imply probably that there are a lot of the peripherals for the chip actually sit in in this block here. So, um, now uh, I've changed the photograph entirely. It's a completely new chip. This is the DRAM, uh, basically. What are we looking at here? Um, uh, you can see there's I.O. pads uh, on the sides of the chip. Oops, I'm going to change color here. I just change to a red pen. The I.O. is actually on the edges of the chip uh, for this particular DRAM. Uh, you can see there's a, there's you know obviously a uh, column and row structure here. There's banks as well. Um, and there looks like there's power distribution probably in the center here to get to all those banks. So, so of course, you might ask yourself, uh, what is that DRAM? Uh, it's uh, easy to find a die mark, fortunately. It's from a company called uh, Elpedia. Uh, that was a Japanese company. Uh, Elpedia went out of business about eight years ago. Micron bought their assets. So um, we're obviously not looking at a really new die. And um, then if I go back to the Broadcom die, I'll see another interesting bit of uh, technology. Copyright 2014, again, seven years ago. And of course, you might think to yourself, geez, those are almost obsolete parts. Um, and of course, um, they are actually relatively stable parts. Uh, uh, Raspberry Pi's success uh, isn't using the newest of the new. It's uh, packaging things in a very cost-effective manner, providing really excellent tool and support. So uh, you can see how you know, they went to a set-top uh, maker of uh, silicon and they used that chip and repurposed it. Uh, the real success, of course, is when you buy it, you have real confidence of a really rich ecosystem. Um, and they do a lot of outreach on learning. So. Um, you don't need the biggest and newest silicon to be successful. Sometimes you actually um, have to recognize the high tech. Often the most successful companies are those who take technology and make it accessible to others. Okay, let's take a look at the RF section of the chip. Um, you can see I'm holding there my tweezers. 
I've taken the little metal lid off. It's basically known as a Faraday shield. It uh, it keeps the RF signals that are inside the shield from leaking out. That's kind of important for uh, getting a certification like FCC. You can see here uh, a very black looking item. It's a chunk of silicon. Uh, it's, in fact, it's the very back of the silicon die. There's actually no epoxy around this device. It's known as a bare bumped die. Uh, so we'll flip it over in a second. But before we do that, uh, what else we can see? Uh, we can see uh, a crystal here, which provides a master timing function. Uh, we can see, of course, the RF, the antenna coming down. The antennas are always very obvious. You get this pattern of the uh, via stitching on the edges of the antenna. And then the antenna running a fairly fat, a fairly fat trace, then running up here. So, um, in fact, it carries on there. It's actually, and to itself, very interesting. But before we get over to that, um, let's uh, take a look at uh, this this chip here. Let's take it off the board and flip over, uh, and you get this uh, very very pretty picture. Um, and of course, you might ask yourself, what am I looking at? And silver dots basically are the solder connections down to the uh, from the integrated circuit. Uh, down to the uh, circuit board. You can see some of these fatter traces are probably power. Um, and uh, you can, of course, sort of see a, a very golden sheen here. Uh, that golden sheen basically is an isolation so that these silicone doesn't short out, essentially. Let me just uh, zoom in and see if we can see some of the RF structures poking through. Ah, here's one. Here's a nice one. You can always tell an RF die, quite frankly, because it has... Um, it has uh, inductors that are fabricated off the metal layer. And uh, we can see a couple here. Uh, if we pan around, you can see all sorts of exciting structures. There's actually several hundred thousand hours of design usually in these. There's another inductor. Okay, so we've analyzed the SOC. We looked at the parts under the RF. It uh, leaves only one major semiconductor, and that's this package here. It uh, looks like a voltage regulator. Um, you always tell that because it's associated with the part. You can see some large inductors and some large capacitors. Um, a good sign you're looking at a voltage regulator. In fact, since we can see two inductors, it looks like it's probably a, a dual output power supply. All we have to do is uh, take the silicon uh, out of the package. No, actually, I show a single die here, but actually there's two dies in there. It's a dual output product, but actually there's two dies in it. <laughs> the Raspberry Pi is just uh, populated with silicon, where there's multiple dyes in the package. Um, this uh, is a uh, FET here, FET structure here. Coming down is basically what provides the uh, the current uh, ca uh, carrying capacity of a regulator. You can see this funny diagonal going along here. I believe that's because uh, sometimes during the rising edge, you want the, it pulling harder in one direction than the other. Um, let's see here. This looks like it's a voltage reference band gap or something, which is used to uh, set voltages very accurately. And of course, you can see all the um, pads here for the connections to uh, other devices. You can see uh, two pads here. This is very common if you're looking at something which carries a lot of current. Often you'll see two pads, and there's uh, basically two bond wires, and that allows, of course, to carry more current. Uh, the maker of the chip uh, is actually just here. It's a little hard to see. So we'll, we'll zoom in here in a second and uh, read off the part number. It's uh, a PAM 2301. Uh, now, this chip actually is the exact same one I tore off the um, last Raspberry I tore down. So it looks like the uh, there's a lot of reuse. That makes sense, of course. You want to always reuse things when they work. So what else? Go oh, M. Uh, you always know copyright, of course. But uh, M is a, a mask, uh, mask marking, so an M in a circle. So. There's actually a specific law uh, is in the U.S. on uh, intellectual property dealing with integrated circuits. Uh, and again, the silicon quite stable, 2007. You know, obviously you see a lot of uh, changes in power supply circuits. You can design them and use them for decades. Uh, the uh, functionality is unchanged. Okay, what else is exciting on the circuit board? Uh, probably the antenna. Uh, you can see it coming out of that metal can here, um, sliding down. Uh, two probably capacitors coming across, and then... You can see the ground plane is in this funny uh, bow tie shape, and then there's uh, two more capacitors going across here, and you might ask yourself, wow, that sounds sophisticated. Uh, it is actually, they claim it's uh, even it's patented. Uh, licensed from a company called Proland AB, uh, that means they're uh, Swedish, and uh, they are kind enough to have at least a um, data sheet on their web. Um, 
It's interesting. I couldn't find the patent number. I'm more familiar with American practices where you have to actually tell the end user what the patent number is. Perhaps it's different in Europe. But um, as we come down in their short form catalog, of course, you can see that same bow tie antenna that we had been looking at. Um, and a little bit smaller here, but of course they customize it for each of the applications. Uh, if you ever use Raspberry Pi, you know, it's really quite amazing how good it is in terms of its uh, ability to pick up your uh, Wi-Fi signal, even though it's a very small circuit board. Um, and of course you can see all the characterization, lots of technology in, uh, in designing of antennas. It's a very specialized profession. Well, there you go. Um, I probably could natter on for a few more hours with this board. Uh, raspberries are always really interesting for their packaging uh, excellence. So, um, and that's really the key of their success. They take uh, parts and they compellingly put them together. Uh, and then they wrap a really excellent ecosystem around them. So they're super easy to use. Hopefully you enjoyed that uh, short little look at the uh, Raspberry uh, Pi 2W0. Uh, uh, I also have on my blog, electronupdate.blogspot.com, uh, these photographs. So should you wish to take a larger look at them, uh, please uh, do so.